Well, hello, everybody. <laughs> Bienvenido, gracias. Should I do the presentation in Spanish or? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, perfect. Gracias. Yeah, thank you, Rick. Uh, very excited to be here. Um, yeah, as Rick mentioned, I am. I was itching to get out and uh, come out and be with real people and uh, <laughs> give a presentation. This is something that I've been doing for. I don't know, maybe like nine, ten years now. I've been going around uh, giving presentations, talking about the Hispanic market, multicultural marketing, um, and uh, all that obviously abruptly stopped uh, about 18 months ago. And uh, um, been doing the webinar thing and the online thing, but it's not the same. It's not the same as being around uh, other other human beings. So I am definitely a social person. And I, when Rick mentioned that he was actually going to do a conference uh, in person, uh, like like he said, I jumped right in and. Uh, and I actually uh, applaud Rick for having the bravery to actually try to put something on, too. So um, we need you know, more people like Rick um, to start to open things up again, you know, to kind of bring us back to hopefully uh, not the new normal, but just normal. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, so yeah, so um, I'm excited to, to be here today and share with you guys a little bit of research, um, just as a little bit of background. Um, so you, got the, you guys got the intro um, on my background. Um, and this is, a, this is a research study that I put together with a bunch of people at my company. Um, uh, and this is a little bit about uh, Census. So we're, uh, we're basically a market, uh, marketing advertising agency. We're based in Los Angeles, but we have offices all around the country in Atlanta, uh, Austin, Texas, uh, Washington, D.C. And then we actually have a whole team in Mexico. I don't know if I've ever mentioned to you, Rick. Yeah, we've got a whole team down in Mexico. Um, we've been building out um, uh, a really quality group of folks down there doing web development and, and uh, digital content creation. Uh, I started the company about 22 years ago. Um, yeah, it's a, basically me. Uh, started out in uh, my brother-in-law's uh, warehouse. He lent me some space and so kind of grown from there. Um, and uh, you know, I am a Cuban Ameri very proud Cuban American. My parents immigrated to this country. Um, um, and I grew up around other Hispanic business owners, because that's what we did. That's what we do in this country, right? We come here, we 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 uh, we get up on our own feet. We we build businesses. We usually to service our own community. So I grew up in uh, among Cuban Americans in Southern California. My dad was a realtor, by the way. So um, I, I come from a long line of uh, you know my dad, my sister, uh, my brother were all in the real estate business, and uh, I just grew up around that. And so for me, it was natural to start my own business. Um, and um, in terms of my company, um, so we've been doing, you know, I, initially when we started out, we, we were really focused on the Hispanic market, helping companies reach the Hispanic community, uh, very digitally focused, um, you know, helping them use online and digital to reach Hispanics. Um, and then about 10 years ago, I started, um, I'm really, I'm kind of a geeky guy. I like, I like research, um, my economics background. Uh, I love doing data analysis. And so... Um, I've always felt that the marketing business was a little soft when it came to, you know, good data. You know, you see a good ad or uh, uh, advertising campaign, but there was never, you know, it was usually a really cool idea, but there wasn't really a lot of data behind it. And so I've always wanted my company to be a little more focused on data and research. And so 10 years ago, I started uh, basically doing, funding my own research and then publishing it as a way to start conversations about, you know, a lot of things that I just saw in the marketplace that I didn't think also made a lot of sense, the way people were talking about Hispanics. You guys heard some of that good data uh, earlier um, uh, in terms of Hispanic home ownership and Hispanic uh, prosperity. But I basically wanted to get into the conversation with data because people are more likely to listen to you when there's some really good data behind what you're saying. And so I started producing uh, original research. Um, and it all started with the millennial thing. Uh, a couple years back, everybody was talking about millennials and nobody was really talking about some of the differences because I, you know, I'm not a millennial, I'm a Gen Xer, but I could see the way people were talking about millennials didn't apply to Hispanic millennials. I'm like, that, that's not, they're very different. They have a different attitude. All this stuff we're hearing about millennials, they're entitled, they don't work hard, all this stuff. It's like, that's the, that may be the case for some millennials, but not for, definitely not for Hispanic. And I think there's some differences with Asian and other, uh, and, and African American millennials. And so we did our first uh, research project, which was the, uh, we called it the Hispanic Millennial Project. Um, and our data did bear out what, what, I, what were my hypotheses, right? That, these, that millennials are very different depending on their ethnicity and their racial background. 
Um, and then a couple years later, we did another research project on Gen Z, uh, kind of the younger generation after millennials. And then a couple years ago, I started thinking, you know, nobody's talking about boomers anymore. Um, you know, they have all the money, uh, they have all the resources. Uh, what the hell's going on? So, um, so I also um, decided let's do a, let's do a study on on boomers, and so. Um, we, we launched the Boomer Cultures Report. And that's what I'm going to walk you guys through today and share with you some of the findings from that. Um, it's, uh, I mean, just as a little bit of background, we started this project um, in early 2019, kind of ideating how we're going to do this research. Um, uh, obviously, the, the idea was for us to, to do research and look at the Boomer population by ethnicity, so Hispanic, African American, uh, Asian Boomers, and then compare them to non-Hispanic white. Right? And by the way, as I go through the report and I share some of the findings with you, you'll see the term Caucasian in there. And sometimes that gets confusing because t technically most Hispanics are Caucasian. Uh, there's, a, um, you know, there's, a, there's a lot of confusion about race versus ethnicity. Hispanic, as, as defined by the U.S. Census Bureau, is an ethnicity. Uh, now you can be a black Hispanic, you can be an Asian Hispanic, and you can be a white Hispanic. And so, um, so just so you know, as I go through it, there's... Um, there's a couple groupings in there of Caucasians, and that includes Hispanics, because you know about 90% of Hispanics are Caucasian. Um, so again, why boomers? Why do we, you know, why do we want to do this study and look into this population? Well, first of all, there's a ton of boomers. Um, actually, uh, they are the second largest generational group in the United States. Um, after, millennials pass them as the largest group, but not by much. Um, and you know there are 71 million boomers in the United States between ages 55 and 73. Um, as I mentioned, this is where the majority of the wealth in the United States is uh, at this moment. So they hold about 2.6 trillion dollars in buying power, um, and they're pretty diverse. Um, and that's the, that's the part that most people don't realize is that you know they think oh it's the younger generations that are the more diverse ones, but there's actually 25 percent of boomers are either Hispanic black or Asian. So it's, it's a pretty diverse uh, population and nobody really pays attention to like what's different about the Hispanic uh, or the black or the, or the Asian uh, boomer population. And that's what we decided to do with our research. So the methodology, so this was kind of an interesting study. So we did this study, we were going to do multiple waves. Um, we did the first study in November of 2019, so immediately before the pandemic. Um, and then, you know, we were getting ready to publish the report in February when, you know, the whole world got turned upside down. And we decided, hey, we can't, we can't publish this report right now because, you know, everything's changing. And particularly early on with, with COVID and, and the disproportionate impact on, on older Americans, we, we said we got we to go back actually out into the field and do another study to see. And so we ended up doing another wave of the research in July. So we kind of have a pre-COVID and then sort of in the midst of COVID um, uh, report. And it just kind of worked out that uh, because of the timing. Now, again, July was, is very different than where we are today. So we're going to actually go back out the field and do another wave of the study that, you know, we're hoping by the fall things will be kind of in a post-COVID. So we'll have a pre-COVID, we'll have a during COVID, and then uh, post-COVID. Um, but essentially, this is the breakdown for um, in terms of the, the way the research was structured. It was, a, it was a national study, so we looked at uh, about 1,300 individuals, um, and about half of them were, were non-Hispanic white, and then we had, a, we had a nationally representative sample. We oversampled for Hispanic, African American, Asian, and then we also had a group that was like two or more races, um, which is interesting as well. So um, that's kind of the breakdown of the, the structure of the research. And... Um, you know, being good marketers as we are, we're not going to just put all this research out all at once. We're going to drip it out little by little, uh, try to get as much attention for ourselves. So the first wave of the study, we published, um, uh, we published it in uh, March. So that was the COVID-19 wave. So that's where we basically looked specifically at issues related to COVID. Um, and then uh, uh, about two weeks ago, we published the exercise in health. So I'm going to be actually sharing with you guys these first two waves of the study. And then we're going to be publishing another wave on... Uh, home and family, um, so sort of their attitudes about, you know, family, family structure, um, purchasing behaviors, so what are they buying, what are the things that they're, um, 
uh, purchasing, uh, media and technology, their usage of you know, digital technology, how are they consuming media, are they streaming, that kind of stuff. And then retirement planning um, will be the last wave, sort of the financial and wealth component of the, of the study. So there's a ton of great data, um, but today I'm just going to focus on the first two, um, which has a lot of really interesting findings. Um, so the first one, as I mentioned, is around COVID-19. And by the way, as I'm going through this, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to stop me. This is super informal um, and uh, happy to try to answer any questions. So um, I'm, gonna I'm not going to I'm not going to go through and share just a ton of charts and graphs. Um, I want to kind of tell a story, and that's something we, I really believe in, is like the data needs to tell a story, and a story that's actionable. Hopefully, um, there'll be something interesting that you learn from this that'll maybe be applicable to your business, or just kind of how you look at um, um, you know, what you do for a living. Um, so the first one, um, boomers are tired of their families. So this was a really uh, surprising finding. And we always structure this research in a way where we have a lot of open-ended questions. Uh, we have a lot of options in the way that people can answer the questions because we're trying to explore and understand what's going on without coming in with our own biases. Um, so this was really interesting. So um, we asked, uh, you know, we asked boomers, um, you know, do you enjoy, enjoy spending time with your family? Um, and um, so in the July survey, less than half of the boomers said that they enjoy spending time with their children. Um, and that actually was a decline of 7% from the November study. So the amount of time that they wanted to spend with their family had actually gone down um, during COVID. Um, and, uh, and then also when we asked the question about spending time with your grandchildren, uh, it had also gone down. Um, so they also reported even fewer, 33% in the July survey, uh, reported that they enjoyed spending time with their grandchildren compared to 37% in the first survey. So we saw, and this is, this is a statistically significant uh, reduction in their desire to spend time with their children. Did you say it wasn't statistically significant? Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was, it was uh, well outside the margin of error and based on the sample sizing, yes. So uh, although these were different individuals, we had a large enough sample to basically say, yes, this is something that we saw that was different. Um, so this was super interesting. It's not what we expected. Uh, in fact, we, you know, obviously the, the, the predominance thinking is that most um, older Americans were probably not even seeing their family um, during the COVID pandemic and were probably anxious to spend more time with their family. So this was kind of contradictory to what we expected. Um, and uh, yeah, um, we have a couple of reasons, a couple of hypotheses. Um, and, it, and it really breaks down, you can start to see the difference by ethnicity, right? Because, um, you know, enjoy spending time with their children. Um, so Hispanics actually were the group that, that did want to spend the most amount of time with their family, 48%. It kind of went down from there. Uh, and then African Americans were the second one, most likely. And this kind of goes with what we know about, you know, these different ethnic audiences. Uh, you know, the importance of family, larger, far, uh, the importance or the, more, the likelihood of you having a larger extended family is more common among Hispanics, followed closely by African Americans, um, Caucasians, although the Asians really surprised us. This was the group that didn't, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, you know, that they uh, did not spend, uh, enjoy spending time with their children. Um, I mean, there's some theories we have about this having to do with COVID as well. Um, because the Asian and interestingly, the Hispanic were the two groups that were the most concerned and worried about COVID. Um, but uh, I'll talk, to, I'll hold, hold on on that one because I'll, I'll come back to it. Um, and then in, in spending time with their grandchildren, there was a huge difference between Asians and Hispanic boomers in terms of wanting to spend time with their grandchildren, which was just, uh, you know, really surprising to us because that's not what you would think. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, what's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a COVID factor there. Yeah, because you see in the Asian community, there's definitely a, a much heightened fear and concern around COVID. Um, so, I mean, for us, uh, you know, you asked the question, why do we think this is happening? Well, one, we think that actually boomers were spending more time with their family than, than sort of what was the prevailing wisdom out there in the media, that they were, that they were isolated and they weren't, no, they were actually spending more time with their family and kind of getting tired of it. Um, you know, just, they, they weren't doing the other things that they were doing. They were maybe not um, spending time with friends. And so it was just family and family only and nothing else, right? And so there was, and you'll see when I get into the, the questions around vacation, that there is a, definitely a desire to get out and do other things. Um, 
And then um, we asked some questions about relocation. Obviously, with, with folks as they're retiring, there's a you know, question about where are they going to retire? Are they going to move near where their kids are? Because we know there's been a lot of migration in the country, and, and oftentimes uh, boomers do not live in the same uh, parts of the country as their, as their grown children. And so, um, so interestingly, pre-COVID, 6.7% um, plan, planned um, uh, to move during the next 12 months. Um, and among Hispanic boomers, uh, it, was, it was slightly higher, it was about 9.5%. Um, and Asian boomers were actually the group that was the most, uh, who had indicated that they were, uh, that they had recently moved uh, to be closer to their kids and relatives. 18% planned to move in the next 12 months. So a pretty, lar a pretty sizable number of Asian boomers pre-COVID had indicated that they had either recently moved or were planning on moving in the next 12 months. And then during COVID, um, those numbers dropped precipitately in terms of their desire to move, to be closer to their family. Only 4% plan to move during the next 12 months. And that's obviously, you know, because of all the uncertainty around uh, COVID, you know, where are you going to move? Uh, you know, what's locked down, what's not? There's a lot of issues going on there, a lot of uncertainty at that time. Um, and then for Hispanic boomers, um, they were the one group that indicated the highest number in terms of planning to move in the next 12 months. And it was only 7%, but that was the one group that kind of stood out a little bit more in terms of uh, intention to move. Um, the next big finding is that, you know, boomers are tired of vacationing close to home. Um, so uh, this is not so, so, not so surprising, but um, uh, we asked the question, you know, um, you know, uh, are you tired of vacationing near home? So again, in November versus July, and the numbers spiked, right? Um, not, again, not, <laughs> not surprisingly, everybody's been forced to not, you know, leave. Um, obviously, this is, a, this is a population that is, you know, drives international travel. Obviously, you know, things like the cruise, uh, you know, uh, the cruise business, everything's been heavily impacted, particularly because of this group, because they're not traveling as much. So, um, so this is uh, not surprising, and among Asians, this was interesting too, because this kind of goes against the concern over traveling uh, around COVID, but this was the group that indicated the highest percentage uh, increase uh, in terms of their desire to um, travel outside, or you know, they're tired of being uh, close to home. Um, Caucasians were followed the Asian group in terms of, um, there was a 13% increase, um, but um, for African Americans, it was uh, fewer than 50% disagreed with the statement, whereas over 50% of Asian, uh, Asians and Caucasians favored traveling away from home. Um, there was very little difference we saw in the data between Hispanic and sort of non-Hispanic whites, so that was, uh, that was also uh, somewhat interesting. And then 71% um, of boomers uh, are excited to see places they've never been to, um, and this was consistent pre-COVID, uh, so there wasn't much of a change there. Um, among Asians, it did go down to 13%. So, uh, although they want to, they're tired of travel, uh, tired of traveling near, staying near home. They um, maybe are less adventurous as they were pre-COVID. So that's kind of an interesting finding. And then um, uh, African American boomers were the ones who most, um, are most, uh, uh, they indicated uh, an 8% increase in their desire to go and see places they've never seen before after you know during COVID. And then. Um, this was another interesting finding, and if you think about it, it kind of makes sense, but uh, boomers are tired of social media. Um, I think you probably say that for a lot of uh, demographic groups, but um, it was particularly pronounced. Um, so we asked questions about, so we looked at their, again, this is self-reported data, but we have other data from like media tracking services that do indicate that this is a, a consistent trend, um, but that uh, there was a significant change in social media usage among boomers um, pre-COVID, um, and then in the midst of COVID. So, uh, and you could see Facebook, uh, if, you're, if you're not familiar, Facebook is the most popular uh, platform among uh, older Americans. Um, and that's actually where most of their growth has been coming from the last you know, five, six years. And so if boomers are dropping on Facebook, that's a big problem for Facebook because that's who they depend on. Uh, younger demographics are primarily using platforms like Instagram and Snap. And so um, to see a 16% drop in the course of, you know, you know, six to eight months, that's, that's big. Um, but there was a drop across the board. These other platforms are not as popular uh, among boomers, but we still saw pretty precipitous drops in terms of Instagram, Twitter, and uh, Pinterest, 9%, which, yeah. Facebook drop, was that before the election or after the election? This is before the election. Yeah, yeah, it's a good question, yeah. <laughs> 
well, yeah, to see, yeah. And that's, that's the hypothesis there, right? Which is like, you know, it's become so politicized, it's become so angry, you know, people don't want to be on Facebook anymore, and so they're, you know, they've, they've gotten off. Um, you know, we asked the question, are you excited to connect with social media? And you could see just a huge drop that went down um, pre-COVID and then, you know, in July of COVID. Um, Asians reported the steepest decline in using social media to reconnect with friends and family. Um, it was, uh, the decline was much higher with, uh, than among Caucasians. Um, and then African Americans, they didn't really show a big decline. Um, and then there was little difference between the uh, racial groups in terms of the recent usage. Um, and so, yeah, we, uh, why is this happening? And, and, you know, one, it's just the politicization, you know, and just the, the level of anger and, the, and the, the type of content. You know, people, I'm sure you all know, people have all lost friends and don't want to talk to people. You know, things got really, have gotten really uh, uh, polarizing on social media, particularly on Facebook. Um, you, you notice that there wasn't as much of a decline on Instagram because Instagram, for the most part, is like pretty pictures, right? And so you don't tend to have as much political or um, a po polarizing content. So um, this was something that I think is, is a really interesting finding to think about. And then um, another finding is that COVID, it really hasn't changed. It's changed a lot of things, but it hasn't changed everything for boomers. So um, a couple things that we kind of were contrary to what we might have expected. So streaming. Um, you know, you, everybody was talking about during COVID that everybody was streaming now, everybody's using Netflix, everybody's using Hulu, um, all the different streaming services, but binge consumption, you know, binge streaming um, only increased slightly from 28% of boomers indicated that they had recently uh, streamed, uh, done binge, and if, I think you're all familiar with that term binge, right, where you watch an entire series um, all at once. Um, Boomers are not, uh, didn't significantly increase that, um, that kind of activity. Uh, it only gone up from 28% to 30%. And then things like, uh, you know, home delivery, we would have expected that to be a huge increase uh, among boomers, again, because of the concerns around COVID. And we didn't see a, a very big, yeah, um, boomers actually shifted away from home delivery of food and other products from 55% pre-COVID to 48% during COVID. So that was really surprising that that uh, number hadn't, had gone the opposite direction of what we had anticipated. Um, and that's particularly among Hispanic and, and Asian boomers. That one's not super surprising, particularly when you think about food. I mean, we know in a lot of you know, major um, markets where you have a large Hispanic or Asian population, they tend to shop at, uh, for food particularly, in um, ethnic grocers, right? So those are not the kind of ones that Amazon's delivering to your house, so, but yeah. We, is that, is that count, that's not counted home delivery, that's... No, 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 we were at like, like groceries and, and then also products like, or like just e-commerce having so stuff is, to... So is it possible that they were doing, they were shifting from uh, home delivery of food to, to uh, um, takeout? Um, that's... In, that's what I'm doing. Yeah, that's possible. Um, home cooking? Yeah, home cooking. Um, but in terms of uh, so home delivery of food, though, these would be like fresh groceries and stuff as opposed to... Um, eating out, like having somebody like a DoorDash or anything like that. So it's possible. Um, we think that, um, you know, particularly the fact that among um, Hispanic and Asian boomers, they're still shopping heavily. And we have other data from other clients where they're still shopping very uh, heavily at these ethnic grocery stores, where which is where they do most of their consumption. So the, you know, the Hispanic supermarket, you know, out in California where I am, you have these, all these huge Asian supermarkets that are, you know, they, they're, 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 their numbers only went through the roof during, during the pandemic, so. And then, um, you know, this is consistent with the, some, some of the vacationing uh, uh, data that we got, but there's a, clearly a thirst for in-person activities. Um, now, you know, these numbers are not huge, but, and this is in July, um, so, you know, we would assume these numbers have gone up since then, but 20% uh, were interested in actually attending in-person events, which is slightly up from 18% pre-COVID, which is a, a little bit surprising. Not a huge number there, but it didn't drop precipitously, which I think is the more important thing. It kind of held steady. Um, so um, there is definitely a segment of boomers who are ready, to, you know, who are ready in July to go back. Um, and uh, that number's probably gone up since then. Uh, but that was a little bit surprising for us, too, to find that out. So that, that was the first wave. Um, the second wave of the report, we looked at exercise and health. Um, and this is just another thing that we wanted to kind of 
uh, look at from a perspective of you know what are boomers' attitudes around um, exercise and, and keeping themselves healthy, um, particularly in light of, of everything that's happened with COVID. And so um, exercise was kind of the first thing we looked at. Um, and so you know boomers uh, reported a, a varying amounts of exercise when it came time to uh, when, when it came to a couple. So we asked questions around you know how much time do you exercise, uh, how much amount of time in terms of um, number of uh, hours, uh, uh, amount of time that you exercise. So these are hours um, spent um, exercising per week. Uh, intensity, is it vigorous, moderate, or low? And then the type of activity that you uh, 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 involve in doing your uh, exercise. So it was interesting. Um, uh, boomers indicated pretty high levels of, uh, of number of hours that they uh, exercise per week, so very active. Um, in terms of intensity level, the most common was um, that sort of middle level, moderate. Um, and then type of activity, primarily it was walking, brisk walking, uh, and then there was usually, a, 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 there was a big drop off after that for things like yoga and other more um, rigorous um, exercise activities. And then we asked how often do you exercise in a week? Um, and there was some really interesting deviations here with regards to the different ethnic groups. So um, in terms of date, so clearly Asians were the most active um, uh, and actually the, involved in the most rigorous, I'll show, share in a, in a second. Um, so in terms of uh, boomers that indicated that they, that they exercised daily, uh, it, was, uh, it was the Asians who indicated 43% that they um, exercised daily. And then it kind of went down from there. African American boomers were the most likely to, to indicate that they exercised two to three times a week. Um, and then um, uh, Caucasians were kind of in the middle, um, kind of a mixed bag there. But then when we asked the question, uh, type of exercising, so um, some other interesting findings here. Um, so uh, pretty common, walking is the number one activity among all, all boomers, depend, uh, regardless of uh, ethnic, break, uh, uh, ethnic group. And then brisk walking was the, was the highest among Caucasians. Um, and then interestingly, yoga was uh, most often uh, something that Asian um, uh, boomers participated in. There was a big drop off other than that. Um, although you did see a lot of Asians also playing sports, uh, followed by Caucasians. And then um, some more findings by race. Um, so, you know, overall Asians reported the most frequency and, and just general activity of exercise. 43%, uh, as I mentioned before, exercising daily. They're more likely to be exercising uh, higher levels of intensity. Um, although African Americans reported uh, exercise the least of all the groups surveyed, um, and then type of activity, there wasn't you know a huge difference there as I as I shared with that data. Um, in terms of health, um, this was some really interesting stuff that we looked at as well. Um, so the fear of getting sick. Um, so you know not surprisingly, all you know all boomers were were generally concerned um, about getting sick, um, and this was pretty consistent sort of pre-COVID and then during COVID. Um, so 43% said that they were somewhat or extremely worried about discovering a health condition. 54% uh, indicated that they were worried about keeping a disease at bay. 58% said they were worried about becoming ill with, with COVID-19. So um, those are the kind of the things that were top of mind for them. And then differences by gender, not surprising. There is a huge difference when it came to uh, male versus female. And we see this for every generation, so this is pretty consistent. So females tend to be more worried and more concerned about health uh, issues, uh, men not as much. Uh, so you know we're indestructible. We don't worry until we get run over by a bus, um, <laughs> and the, that's why we die earlier. We get hit by lightning uh, twice as likely. Um, so 48% uh, of uh, uh, women were uh, worried about discovering new health conditions. Only 39% of men were, and obviously that's not a reflection of you know. Uh, incidents, it's just a perception, right? M men are more risk, uh, um, more risk taking, and so it just definitely showed. And then there was some pretty big uh, gaps there in terms of concern around COVID-19. Uh, I've always done informal, uh, uh, my own inform informal surveying, walk uh, walking around and looking at folks, and I always notice that it's the women who are wearing the masks much more than the men. Um, and I notice particularly older men, and this is in California, uh, were the most likely to not wear masks outside. So this is consistent with the, uh, with the data that I see out there. Um, you know, even though 52% were concerned about COVID, 64% of uh, female um, boomers were concerned about COVID. And then uh, worried about getting sick. Um, 
So, um, so Hispanic versus non-Hispanic. Um, so you could see that Hispanics are a lot more concerned about COVID um, and then worried about not being able to see their family as a result of COVID. Uh, there, was a, there was a pretty big uh, gap there. But this is something that we just noticed a lot in the data too, that there was definitely, in terms of uh, what I'll call sort of COVID and anxiety, much higher among Hispanics, much more concerned. And that's not common with other health conditions in the Hispanic community. So there is definitely a heightened awareness and concern, I think, I mean, from other research that we've done, you know, a lot of Hispanics tend to work in, um, in industries that were more impacted, you know, they tend to work in meat packing and in food service and things like that, where there was a lot of COVID transmission. So there was definitely a heightened sense of it. And, it, and this trickled up to um, older uh, Hispanics as well, who are very concerned about uh, COVID. Um, the cost of healthcare is also a big thing that we looked into. Um, you know, boomers are certainly concerned about getting sick, but um, overall, 59% of them indicated that they were worried about rising costs of healthcare. Um, and then 41% were concerned about access to healthcare. Um, so that was um, something that we looked into, and we kind of broke this down by age and gender and income. Um, so we actually had kind of two groups in the in, in the survey and the research that we did, we said had sort of younger boomers and then older boomers. Um, in terms of concerns about uh, cost, um, interestingly, the younger boomers were more concerned about healthcare costs than the older boomers. Um, and then uh, quality was also, so generally, you know, younger boomers were more concerned uh, about both cost and quality. Um, and then not surprisingly, women were most concerned um, about uh, cost and uh, quality access. And then as your income went down, not surprisingly, your concern about cost and access uh, went up. So we saw that from the data. And then um, we did ask a lot of questions. We, you know, mental health is, I think, probably gonna be the biggest issue that I think we're all gonna have to grapple with coming out of COVID. And it's not, it's something people are starting to talk about, but the, you know, what are the long-term impacts of COVID and what, how it's, impacted our society, our culture, uh, mental health is gonna be a big one. Um, and a lot, although a lot of focus has been on sort of younger um, populations in the United States, I think the impact on, on boomers is, is really important. And so it's something we looked into. Um, you know, over, overall though, half of boomers reported that they're not worried about um, feeling alone, which actually, so their concern about being alone went down during COVID, so that was kind of surprising. Um, and they reported being less worried about being help, feeling helpless or vulnerable. Um, not surprisingly, the boomers that were uh, most concerned um, about uh, being, you know, feeling vulnerable were those that were uh, older, those that were, um, you know, their partner status, you know, either they were widowed or single um, or their income was much lower. So there was a direct line correlation, right, between some of these mental health concerns um, and your, your basically your age your partner status and um, your uh, income. So some of the, some of the factors here kind of summarize uh, impacting mental health. Um, younger boomers were more, uh, were more likely to say they were not worried uh, compared to their older. Uh, household status, if you were married or partnered, your mental health status was, was stronger. Um, and then again, income, if you had below 150K, uh, you, you, some of these concerns were much, much uh, bigger. So that's a lot of data I shared with you guys. I wanted to kind of just wrap this up by sharing some kind of insights, some takeaways, some things that we're noticing from this data. You know, what do we do with all this? Um, so some, some insights and implications. I mean, it's pretty clear that, that the pandemic has created fatigue among everybody, but particularly among boomers. Um, you know, the, the, the pandemic and the response to the pandemic has impacted boomers in some expected as well as some unexpected ways. Um, some of them are eager to get back into uh, in-person activities and travel. Um, although they enjoy spending time with their family, with their children and grandchildren, it's not as much as we thought um, before. And they aren't shifting wholesale to new media the way that we thought they would as a result of the pandemic. Um, uh, they're not shifting their online behavior significantly. Um, and then there are clear differences in some of the behavior and attitudes among Asian, Black, and Hispanic boomers. Uh, their intentions to move in your family, um, you know, who's most disaffected by social media, um, and then their attitudes about, their positivity about spending time with family. Um, it's also clear that Asian boomers are the most active um, segment of the boomer population in the United States. Um, you know, 
This is another one that's, I think, really interesting for a lot of health, uh, folks in the healthcare space, which is COVID has taken up all the oxygen in the room when it comes to your health, particularly among boomers. Um, it's, you know, all their focus, a lot of their concern has been around, um, uh, around COVID at, ex at the expense of other uh, health issues, other potential health con uh, conditions. And that's particularly acute for Latino boomers who are the most preoccupied around COVID at the expense of other things um, that they probably should be paying as much or equal attention to. Um, healthcare costs and access concerns, it's a bigger concern to younger and female boomers, while access is more of a concern for multicultural boomers. Um, and then some, some initial hypotheses that we have, um, you know, the, the pandemic has actually brought boomers and their families together more than we had initially expected to be the case, particularly among multicultural boomers. Um, Social media used to be a place to connect and keep up with family. Politics and COVID have made Facebook, Twitter, and even Instagram too polarizing and negative for, for boomers. Um, African-American boomers appear to be the most negatively impacted by COVID in terms of actually being impacted, but you know, Hispanics tend to be the ones that are most sort of psychologically impacted by COVID. Um, and then boomers, particularly Asian and Caucasian, have not been as scared into changing their physical preferences and activities. That's something that um, we definitely see, in, even in some of the other elements of the report that we haven't released yet, that there is maybe um, a resilience around their behaviors that hasn't changed as much as we thought it would because of the pandemic. And then um, just some actionable insights, you know, social media, maybe there's been definitely a move in our business to say, you know, using, putting a lot of emphasis on social media as a way to reach uh, boomers. Maybe that doesn't make as much sense anymore. Maybe that just shouldn't be the focus. We didn't ask any questions to determine whether they, you know, what their political um, sort of uh, preferences or attitudes are so that we could parse it. Um, I can guarantee you that there's a difference. <laughs> absolutely. And um, although, you know, interestingly with survey data, it tends to skew more liberal um, just in general and it tends to skew more because it tends to skew more female. And uh, on average, women tend to be a little more liberal. Men tend to be a little more conservative. Um, so I'm not sure what's going on, you know, if there, but I mean, it definitely is a, is something that impacts people's, yeah, we didn't, we didn't. Well, and we're not saying it shouldn't be part of the media plan. It just shouldn't be maybe the central focus, uh, particularly Facebook, because, and again, I, we have other data that supports this, that you're seeing. I mean, Facebook is actually kind of worried because they're, they're seeing drop use, drops in, in usage across the board. Um, so kind of treating Facebook as kind of the central sort of marketing tactic for this audience is what we're, what we're basically saying. Maybe you shouldn't do that. Maybe you should consider um, other things that you traditionally have done. I mean, we're seeing TV consumption among boomers explode, right? And so, you know, TV is still incredibly relevant. Radio is kind of is a mixed bag because, you know, people aren't commuting as much. Um, and people aren't in their cars as much. Um, and there's also been shifting in behavior towards things like podcasting and sort of longer form content. So it's a little harder to reach. But TV, if I would say there's like something that you should pay more attention to, it's TV. Because that is where we're seeing a lot more um, consumption. Well, is it TV actually advertising related or is it Netflix type stuff? Well, connected. it's a combination. I mean, connected TV is a big one, right? Where it's not just a Netflix that's not ad supported where you can't run ads, but it's also people just accessing content through like a Roku or some other device where they're just watching on demand stuff um, or, they're, or they're directly, uh, you know, um, subscribing to a particular package of things that they want, right? Um, but we're definitely seeing TV is, and, and when we say TV, I'm sorry, I, I should be clear, I'm not just talking about broadcast and cable. It's um, viewing video on, you know, on, uh, on a device in their home. So, yeah. Um, and then um, we definitely think it makes a ton of sense, and this is a little self-serving, but we do think from the data that there's clearly differences in attitudes, behaviors, beliefs among the different ethnic groups that make up the, the boomer population. So a Hispanic boomer is different than an African-American boomer, and marketing and communications to those should be tailored. Uh, in a way that makes, um, that sort of takes into consideration some of the differences that do exist. Um, I, you know, I put in the point here about travel. Um, 
there is going to be a boom, I think, um, uh, of travel. We're starting to see it. I mean, I, you know, I flew here. I was telling Rick, man, the airport was packed. The flights are packed. Um, it's not, uh, I'm noticing it's not quite the, the sort of vacation travel yet. It's more of the seeing the family and everybody's getting back out. But I think there's going to be a huge boom in, uh, particularly among boomers who are going to get out there and they're going to be uh, vacationing and spending a lot of that pent up demand uh, for, for travel. Yeah, this stuff really interests me because we, uh, I mean, we, we have CE classes, continuing ed classes for builders right now around boomers and millennials. And, you know, really those two markets are almost 150, 60 million. That's correct, in yeah. The United States, which is really the home buying market right now. And, uh, you know, um, there's a lot of assumptions. Rick made reference to that earlier that, you know, boomers are downsizing. That's actually not necessarily happening. Boomers are actually, uh, some of them are buying more square footage, you know, even going into their retirement years, maybe in a different market. Yep. But, uh, yeah, so I really find that interesting on the social media. The millennials are very active on social media. What, what I think is happening with social media is a segmenting of social media markets. So, you know, now millennials don't, they're not as interested in Facebook and some of these traditional platforms. Mm -hmm. They're going to a whole different platform yep. where as a baby, I'm right on the line of baby boomers. Uh, and and I, I see more of the baby boomers not adopting some of their platforms like WhatsApp and all these yep. other things. So, which I don't. And, like, and then you got like TikTok, which is like all Gen Z and younger. Like that's what my kids are. Yeah. 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 No, definitely. Like social media has become in incredibly fragmented, almost like the way you know you had with TV and cable, right? Where you had different, completely different media consumption based off of uh, your age um, or uh, uh, you know just by demographic. So definitely, social media has completely fragmented into different age groups are doing different things. Um, yeah, and then the, just kind of last thing here. Um, as it relates to some of the health and, and fitness things that we talked about. So, I, you know, I definitely think that Latino boomers are going to need a little bit of reassurance about accessing. There's been a lot of, and I'm sure you've read a lot of the, there's been a lot of talk about this for a while now, people putting off uh, medical procedures, preventative health, not going to the doctor. I was just reading something about a guy who went into the ER and was saying the ER was packed and it wasn't COVID, it was all these people who hadn't gone to the doctor for the last nine months are all going to the ER now, right? And, and with Hispanics, who also tend to just generally be um, not likely to engage in preventative health and, and those kinds of issues, um, this has only been exacerbated by COVID. And so I feel like uh, we, have a, we now have, we're, we're entering another stage where we need to start to uh, sort of coax and encourage Hispanics to go back out it's okay. You need to go. You know. You need to go see your doctor again. You need to go do the preventative screenings and all those things because there's definitely been a pullback there, and it's going to have an impact. We're going to see, unfortunately, some some bad outcomes related to that uh, because people haven't been getting those screenings, and and this is particularly the case among uh, Hispanic boomers. Um, there's clearly uh, an opportunity for fitness brands and, and and products, particularly you know Asians are heavy consumers. We know that. But we also think there's an opportunity on the flip side with African-American boomers who are not as active um, but have attitudes that sort of indicate that they are uh, concerned about their health. So sort of marketing to them as a, as a sort of a growth uh, uh, market is, is, uh, is, is an, inter an interesting opportunity. Um, and then again, just you know, harping on that point again about other issues, other healthcare issues, healthcare providers, you know, uh, hospital, gr you know, groups, uh, physician groups, insurance companies, they're going to need to start get, getting out there and bringing attention to other things because um, all the preoccupation on COVID has really, um, uh, is going to, is going to cause some issues with uh, condition, other, con other health conditions that need to be given equal, if not more attention moving forward among all boomers. So that's pretty much it. Um, Thanks for listening to all this data. I know it's, uh, appreciate all the questions and yeah. The next, uh, on this particular research on boomers? Yeah, yeah um, in about two weeks, we're putting out the next one, which is the, uh, let's see, which was the one that, um, sorry, I went back to the. Families, I believe. 
it was families, and then yeah, we're going to be releasing these basically every month, every other month through the end of the year, essentially. So, um, um, uh, just just go to um, uh, Hispanic. Uh, if you go to uh, BoomerCulturesReport.com, and you can actually download copies of the reports. These I did basically a summary of this. You can download uh, like two little short white papers that summarize all the stuff I went through today, and then you can sign up, and then when we publish the next reports, you'll just automatically get sent the reports. So, yeah, yeah. Hey, just a quick question. So, obviously, lots of interesting things, and then there's a bunch of nuggets that you don't want to tell us yet, and we will sit on pins and needles. <laughs> I would say so far it's the it, it's been the uh, the the impact of COVID has been has been the one that's I think been most surprising that it's not the impacts were different than I think what we assume they are and I was talking to somebody about this before too um, I think we're going to come out of this whole COVID thing and we're going to realize that the po that the segment of the population that's been the most impacted by COVID psychologically has been the younger generation and not the, not the older generations. And so I had always kind of thought that. I kind of see it out and play. I see it at my, at my company. Like the people who are most afraid to come back to work are under 30, um, which is strange. You know, it's like, and, and the folks that are older who are ready to come back to work are okay. And so I, in, in a sense, this study has kind of like, I have some data now to back up what I'm, what I'm seeing out there. Um, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, the boomers are more resilient um, than millennials. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, this, this. Yeah. They have. They have. They've been through other things. So maybe that's part of it, right? Like, I was having a conversation with my wife. My wife brought this up to me the other day. She's like, you mentioned something a couple of years ago, and it came true. And she's like, you know, we're, we've never as a generation lived through anything. You know, my, my dad lived through World War II. You know, my... You know, uh, some of the uh, some other generations lived through you know wars and other, like we never had anything, right? Um, and and may, maybe this is the thing for the millennials. <laughs> but but, but maybe, I don't know. It seems like it broke them. I don't know. <laughs> And if you look at their and if you look at their income and purchasing power, it's it's you know, I, terrible. I've always been really interested too in the boomer generation uh, right now with migratory patterns. Mm -hmm. Are we seeing one of the largest? I mean, in history, one of the largest uh, uh, movements of you know from the Northeast and the Midwest. Um, yeah. Really, boomers, but not just boomers now because of COVID, they're moving to southern states, and you know that there's. Oh, there's all kinds of interesting data about where people are moving. I mean, where I'm from in California, you have this mass migration of boomers, particularly, right? People that are retiring early, leaving. They're going to, they're going to Arizona. They're going to Texas. Uh, they're going to even Oregon. They're just going anywhere except California. Um, you know, you've got people from the northeast going south, right, to the southeast. Um, you have these interesting, even we were talking about last night, some interesting migration patterns where people, it's also based on income too, you know, people who have money and people who don't. So in California, it's still getting net in, in migration from places like New York, but it's all people with uh, high levels of wealth, right? Um, so you've got this like complete reshifting of, of population in the United States. But yeah, and probably at a level of rapidity that's never been seen before, right? Like what's happened in the last 18 months in terms of population movement. I mean, the census data that came out a couple of months, like a month ago, obviously with the redistricting and everything, you, that was all from 2020, right? That was all done in April. Those numbers, I mean, California alone, about a million people have left California in, in last year, a million people. That's just, that's just massive. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Tennessee. Um, yeah. Idaho. Uh, the fastest growing real estate market is Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Right? Like you can't you can't buy anything in Idaho. Um, 
because you're going to be outbid by all these Californians. They're all buying up land. People, are, and then you have the whole thing with the with the with the, with the teleworking too, right? So you've got the whole other issue where everybody's left San Francisco, for instance. Like, you know, nobody lives in San Francisco anymore. It is the weirdest place. So they're, they're actually seeing a decrease in that and the cost of housing mm -hmm. coming down in San Francisco, which has yeah. not been the case in the last yeah. 20, 30, 40 years. Yeah. So, uh, That's correct. That's right. And then the other thing I think we're going to see in the next few years too is um, immigrate. Like nobody's really talking about this either, but we we have this mass immigration happening right now into the United States. For the most part, Hispanic immigration has been going down. It's been net. It's actually been net negative. So, like Hispanic immigration into the United States peaked in 2006, it was the last year where it was net positive, positive. Um, and it basically was going down after that. Particularly because people weren't coming here from Mexico anymore. There was actually more people moving back to Mexico than were coming here from Mexico, right? And so you had a, oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and then you see a lot of Hispanic boomers who, who are me of Mexican descent are moving back to Mexico and buying land. And, you know. I, I thought that Rick, Rick Aguilar was the one that we had a conversation about this. I thought this was really a compelling uh, point that he had made about the fact that there's going to be a Mm -hmm. You know, and, and what was, I think, Rick, didn't you tell me, I mean, what was the issue with the uh, green, uh, green card, you know, the, that, that was really where everybody was missing the point was if you relax the uh, requirements for green cards or for people to come here and work in jobs, you know, a lot of them, was referencing Mexicans, but say Hispanics in general, weren't really coming here to be citizens, Yeah. you know, which is what everybody That's thinks. correct, yeah. And Some, yeah. Well, and now we've got what's been happening even just in the recent months. You've got, I mean, I estimate we're probably going to have about a million new Hispanics in the United States. And they're not coming from Mexico. They're coming from Central America and they're coming from South America. Uh huh. Well, Puerto Rico's already here. I mean, there's nobody left on the island. They're all, have you been to Orlando? I mean, that's Puerto Rico. And like, <laughs> actually, people moving to Puerto Rico are all these rich bankers from New York. Like, Puerto Rico's turning into all white people from New York. Uh, <laughs> the other thing that is going to go cycling, Andy was saying that the, the uh, millennials are going to be coming back to the United States and they're going to find jobs. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, they're already starting to enter the workforce. Yeah, yeah. Gen Z is basically like 18 to like 30-ish. Yeah, yeah. Like the the youngest end the youngest end of Gen Z are like finishing up college. Yeah, yeah. All right. Thanks, guys.